Welcome to St. Paul's Presbyterian Church in Hamilton, Ontario for worship on Sunday, July the 19th, 2020. It is my prayer that wherever you are as you experience this worship, that you will feel the presence of God, that you will know how much God loves you, and you will know that your home is filled with God's Holy Spirit. We are thankful that Director of Music Blair Havers is here with us today and that the soloist Karen Donahoe will lift our hearts with music today. The scripture reader is Enid Pottinger, Walter Plater is playing the chimes, and Brandon Moffat is here to record the service and then to edit and upload the service so that you may experience it in your home. For the sake of Jesus Christ, you are all welcomed in this worship. Let's worship God. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise and adore you because you are the creator and sustainer of all that is. You were before the beginning of time. You are with us now and you transcend eternity. We praise you because it is your intention to redeem all of creation. We confess that sometimes we doubt your redemptive power. We think that some people are too far gone. We think that some situations are just too bleak to be saved. But all of Scripture is the story of you redeeming what we thought was lost. When you call us to do the impossible, we should remember that you have redeemed light from the darkness. You have redeemed love from hate. You have redeemed life from the grave. Forgive us our doubt and give us the courage to renew our mission in the world today. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we invite Enid Pottinger to read scripture for us. The Old Testament reading for this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 19. We enter the story of Elijah, sort of midway. He's had a contest, a big contest with Jezebel and won it, but nevertheless, he's terrified that she is going to pursue him and take revenge for his victory. So he has departed, probably thinking of suicide, certainly depressed, and spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. Then, exhausted, he takes a pause in a cave. And in the morning after his night in the cave, this morning's scripture reading begins. He, Elijah, it is chapter 19, verse 9. He, Elijah, entered a cave, and there he spent the night. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him, Why are you here, Elijah? Because of my great zeal for the Lord, the God of hosts, he said, 
The people of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thy altars, and put thy prophets to death with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The answer came, Go and stand on the mount before the Lord. For the Lord was passing by. A great and strong wind came, rending mountains and shattering rocks before him. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a low murmuring sound. When Elijah heard it, he muffled his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice, Why are you here, Elijah? Because of my great zeal for the Lord, the God of hosts, he said. The people of Israel have forgotten thy covenant, torn down thy altars, and put thy prophets to death with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. The Lord said to him, Go back by the way of the wilderness of Damascus. Enter the city and anoint Hazel to be king. Anoint Jehu to be the king of Israel and Elisha to be a prophet in your place. Anyone who escapes the sword of Hazel, Je Jehu will slay. And anyone who escapes the sword of Jeshu, Elisha will say, slay. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all who have not bent the knee to Baal, all whose lips have not kissed him. And so Elijah departed. And now for a New Testament reading, which is found in the 14th chapter of Matthew, um, beginning at verse 22, Matthew 14. It's one of a series of stories about the amazing things that Jesus did. Then Jesus made the disciples embark and go on ahead to the other side while he sent the people away. After doing that, he went up the hillside to pray alone. It grew late, and he was there by himself. The boat was already some furlongs from the store shore, battling with a headwind and a rough sea. Between three and six in the morning, he came to them walking over the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were so shaken that, he cri that they cried out in terror, It is a ghost! But at once he spoke to them, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter called to him, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come over to you over the water. Come, said Jesus. Peter stepped down from the boat and walked over the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the gale, he was seized with fear, and beginning to sink, he cried, Save me, Lord. Jesus at once reached out and caught hold of him and said, Why did you hesitate? How little faith you have. Then they climbed into the boat, and the wind dropped, and the men in the boat fell at his feet, exclaiming, Truly, you are the Son of God. So they finished the crossing and came to land at Gennesaret. The word of God to, has come to us this morning from the Old and New Testament. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Enid. And we're so thankful that Karen Donahoe is here to lift our hearts and souls with the gift of music.
Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Blair. God bless you in your ministries of music. Let us pray. Holy God, let your healing word come to these people now through me, or if the need be, then in spite of me, for Christ's sake, amen. As I look at the world today, the overwhelming thought I have is that I want to make a difference in the world. I want to change the way that the world is, and I want to set right all of the things that have gone wrong. I look at the world, and I see hurtful and hateful racism, and I say, how can I live my life in a way that brings an end to racism? I look at a world filled with the injustice of poverty, I see a tremendously unequal distribution of wealth, and I say, what can I do with my life so that the poor do not have to suffer? How can we equal out the great difference between the very rich and the very poor? I see that the world is filled with war and famine, and I want to make a difference. It is my prayer that you have that same feeling that you have a compassionate heart and that in every day you're saying, what can I do? Or crying out to God, use me, O Lord, use me for your wonderful purposes. Very often when I ask myself those questions, I end up saying, I don't think that I can do much. I am too small. I am too weak. I don't think that I can help. And if you have ever thought in those terms, this sermon is for you. This sermon is based on the idea that one individual has the power to change the whole world. And that one individual is you. It's a silly sermon in a way with a strange title. It's a sermon called The Butterfly Effect. And the butterfly effect was a terminology first used in 1952 by the science fiction writer Ray Bradbury. He wrote a little story called A Sound of Distant Thunder. And in that story, a man travels back in time and then comes back to the present. But when he comes back to the present, everything has changed. And his friends point out to him, you must have changed something back in time that has altered the whole timeline and changed the destiny of humankind. But he couldn't think of what he had done until that night when he went to take his boots off and he realized that when he had gone back in time, he had stepped on a butterfly. And that tiny change in that world changed the history of the world forever. Now, I know that you're laughing at that and you're thinking that it's silly, although Ray Bradbury would later provide a pretty good explanation for how one tiny change could affect everything. But he didn't need to. In the year 1972, at the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the theme speaker was a man called Ed Lorenz. He was, of all things, a meteorologist. Uh, Not an ordinary meteorologist like on CHCH television. He had a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he was a professor of meteorology there. And for a whole decade, he had been working on mathematical formulas by which he could predict weather. It was an absolutely amazing science. And he had come to some strange conclusions by creating a computer software that would anticipate weather. And when he was working with that software, he found that if he made a tiny change in the calculation, uh, four or five decimal points down the line, 
things that really shouldn't have any kind of a great effect, that in fact they changed the outcomes drastically. At that 1972 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Ed Lorenz had a speech entitled, If a Butterfly Flaps Its Wings in Brazil, Can It Cause a Tornado in Texas? I know you've heard that term before. Now you know its origin. And many of the people there thought it was a big joke. But Ed Lorenz wasn't joking. His answer to his own theme question was, yes, a force as tiny as the flapping of a butterfly's wings can change massive weather systems. And he explained that there were times when two air masses could be side by side, pushing in different directions, but perfectly balanced. He described it as being on the cusp. And he says that when those air masses are on the cusp and they could go either way, then a force as tiny as the flutter of a butterfly's wings would decide the direction in which they would go. South to Brazil or north towards Texas. He said, the smallest changes can change everything. To help people understand that, he talked about having a giant-sized ball sitting at the very peak of a house and perfectly balanced. He says that ball has to fall one way or the other. And the force that decides which way that perfectly balanced ball falls can be a tiny and insignificant force. He used the terminology, the slightest difference in onset conditions, even a difference that is beyond the human ability to measure, can make a radical difference in the outcome and therefore makes predictions of future outcomes impossible. He said that's why it's so hard to predict the weather. Now, his idea goes against the basic convention of physics. Newtonian physics states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. But Ed Lorenz says, that's not the case. And now you're beginning to see that what Ed Lorenz is doing is making the first practical application of Max Planck's early work on quantum mechanics. And when Ed Lorenz did that and applied it to meteorology, the predicting of weather, everyone in every discipline began to understand that quantum mechanics affected their discipline and therefore had to be taken seriously. The whole idea that the forces that decide what is happening in the world are infinitesimally small, beyond the capacity of human beings to even measure, was a bold new idea. Now, I know you're all fascinated, although some of you who are cynics are saying, well, that's great, Mark, but why are you telling us this in a sermon? What does this have to do with the church and with the Christian gospel? Well, this is it. The terminology that Ed Lorenz used should be the motto of every Christian. The terminology he used was sensitive dependence on onset conditions. The idea that everywhere in the world, everything and all people are on the cusp, all in a state where they can go this way or they can go that way. 
And it often means falling down into the darkness or falling down into the light. And the thing that decides which way all those people and all those events are going to go may be a force as gentle as the flatter of a butterfly's wings or may be as gentle as the influence of one human being who believes in love who believes in the equality of all people, who believes in the inherent worth of all people, and who speaks and acts in accordance with those beliefs. And if Christians believed that, then we would understand that in every moment of every day, there is the possibility that we can change everything. The Lord says, I am making a new heaven and a new earth. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. In the story of Elijah, we heard a story of great and powerful forces, of whirlwinds and earthquakes and fires. But the power of God was not in them. The power of God was in the still, small voice, the voice which spoke to Elijah and renewed within him his belief that he, by God's power, could change the world and send him back into mission. In his ministry, so much of what Jesus does is based on tiny forces and on encouraging us, saying, you are just one person, but if I am in you, You, one weak and frail person, can change the world. He spoke about mustard seeds and about yeast and about a pearl, all things that start as something almost infinitesimally small, but becoming something great. Jesus lived his whole life knowing that the smallest things can change everything. Jesus lived his life according to Ed Lorenz's motto, sensitive dependence on all things, because he understood that every person whom he met was balanced on the cusp between light and dark. And Jesus knew that all it took was a gentle touch to change the direction of a human being's life. When he met Zacchaeus, the tax collector, Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was on the cusp, and Zacchaeus was at the point of deciding that he could either continue in his life of theft and cheating and cruelty, But there was also another force inside of Zacchaeus whereby he knew that was wrong and he wanted to do what was right. He was on the cusp. He was perfectly balanced. And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, today I must dine with you. And in the ensuing moments, Zacchaeus fell down onto the side of the light. When they brought to Jesus the woman who was taken into uh, or accused of adultery, the men who stood there with their stones ready to kill her were men who were on the cusp between good and evil. There was a part of them that were ready to break her skull with their stones 
And they would have thought they were serving God by doing that, but there was something else inside of those men that made them wonder, is this really what God wants? And Jesus didn't use any force. He said to those men, go ahead, throw your stones. But the one who is without sin should throw the first stone. And something happened in the hearts of all those men that instead of falling down into the side of darkness and cruelty and hate, they fell down into the side of love and compassion and forgiveness and grace. And it's so beautiful that the one who threw his stone to the ground first was the oldest man. He had lived the longest. He had gathered the most wisdom. And it was he whose heart was most ready to see the light and the goodness in what Jesus said. Every encounter Jesus had was with a person who could have gone into the darkness or gone into the light and they were balanced and Jesus gently touched their lives and they went into the light. Nicodemus is another. He had so much but so much of what he had was built around the darkness and Jesus amongst the things that he said to Zacchaeus, said these strange and gentle words. He said, he said uh, Nicodemus, he said, the wind blows where it wills. When he said that, something happened in the heart of Nicodemus, and he moved into the side of the light, and away from the darkness. Jesus does not speak in terms of massive and mighty forces. Jesus speaks in terms of mustard seeds and single cups of water and sparrows and wildflowers. And he says, see, power is in these things and power is in every human being to change the world. I pray that you will be renewed in your missionary zeal. I pray you will be renewed in your respect for Christian education. I pray that you will be renewed in your sense of the significant role that the church has to play in overcoming racism, in overcoming poverty, and bringing an end to warfare. And I pray that you realize that the church that has the power to do that is the church that is composed of individuals like you, thinking and speaking and acting for the light, fully convinced that your life is going to make a difference. This week, you are going to have a dozen or maybe a hundred opportunities to change the destiny of humankind. You are going to be in a situation where someone speaks in terms that you recognize to be racist and hateful. And you may speak gently to that person and tell them that all people are equal, that all people are valued in the sight of God. You may be in the presence of someone who speaks against Canadian First Nations people, and you will be the person who is able to express to them the horror of what happened in the residential schools, the horror of what the Canadian government and Canadian churches did through this thing called the Indian Act, and you are going to be able to bring light to that person's heart in such a way that we begin to respect and understand
First Nations persons and allow them to have a voice and to listen to them toward the end of creating justice. You are going to be in situations where someone speaks out against the homeless and says that they are lazy and you are going to have the wisdom to speak against that person and explain to them that no one chooses to be homeless, that the person you see on the street is wrestling with problems that we cannot even begin to imagine, and you are going to help that person who spoke so unkindly to move towards the light. You're going to meet these people in all kinds of places, maybe in the lineup at Dollarama or Freshco, maybe at your own dining room table, maybe at your next Zoom meeting for your work. And be well aware that every word you speak, every thought you think, is capable of moving all those people away from the darkness and into the light. And it is one by one that Christ wins the world for light. and The victory of Christ is made known. We are called to change the world so that it looks a little more like the kingdom of God. I know it looks like an overwhelming task, but now you understand that even the fluttering of a butterfly's wings can change everything. And you are much more powerful than a butterfly. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It is my prayer that through the pandemic, you will continue to provide financial support for your church that you will uphold your commitment to giving a portion of your wealth to the building of Christ's kingdom in the world. Uh, you may mail your gift in, or if you want to look at other ways, such as uh, an electronic gift, please call your elder and they will give you guidance on how you can support the ongoing missions of St. Paul's. Uh, if you would like, you may join Karen as she leads us in singing the hymn 803, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. us pray. O God, who is the creator of all that exists, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, 
we praise and thank you because in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have shown that all of us are precious in your sight, that all people are equal and all people have eternal significance. All people are worthy of dignity and love. You have shown us these wonderful realities in Jesus, but the world is not the way that you want it to be. We live in a world filled with prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, and discrimination of every kind. Certain groups of people are deemed to be worth less than others, and they are treated accordingly. This is wrong. This is the darkness. This is contrary to what Jesus desires for all people. Jesus has called us all to be disciples and has given us the great commission to go out into the world and declare the good news of the worth and equality of all people. Holy God, one of our core ministries in the church is acknowledging and overcoming systemic discrimination. It seems like such a difficult task, but you have called us, and if you have called us, then you have equipped us. As we continue to struggle through a pandemic, we desire to be a help and a strength to everyone in need. We acknowledge that for some people, the pandemic has been much more difficult than for others. We continue to pray for medical researchers seeking a vaccine and effective treatment, for doctors, nurses, and hospital staff, frontline workers, essential workers, we pray for all political leaders that you would give them humility, wisdom, grace, and compassion. We pray for families caring for loved ones. We pray for families who are grieving. We pray for people who are sick even now. Holy God, we pray for all the members of St. Paul's who are struggling with grief or illness, or who are facing circumstances which they feel are beyond their control. Help them, O oh God, and let us be a blessing to everyone whom we meet in the week to come. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who died for our sins, and was raised again that we should live forever in him. Thank you so much for joining us in the online worship this week, and we look forward to being with you again next week. God bless you all. Go in peace. You are free people. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, go with you and the whole world, now and forever. Amen.